Welcome to worship. It's good to see everybody here today. We have some opportunities for service. Uh, many are in the bulletin. We encourage you to please do read your bulletin. Things uh, We're collecting for water, and you can see we still have shoe boxes down here. And on behalf of Pastor John and myself, we'd like to thank everybody for your generous gifts and kind words during Pastor Appreciation. You all have just been amazing, and we just want to say a word of thanks for that. And uh, please do read your bulletin. Uh, Ms. Atkinson wants to say something. You want to come on up? I'd like to make a little clarification on the uh, reception that we're going to have on the 8th after uh, Hanover Harnamy sings. The church is going to provide dessert and drinks, so we're just dependent on you all for the heavy hors d'oeuvres. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Somebody told me that today is Rick Fuller's birthday. Hmm, where's Rick? <laughs> hiding with a red face happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear Rick happy birthday to you all right I think that's all of the opportunities for service unless someone else has something you need to say all right let's worship pray together. Lord, it's a joy to be in your house this morning and to welcome you into this place. Lord, let your spirit just pour over our hearts and our lives and fill this place. Lord, we bring all the stuff in our life to you and we ask, Lord, that the cares of this world will be at the very back of our minds and that you will be at the front of our minds so that we can just focus on worship and praising you. Lord, we just want to say today we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. We, we, we're so glad to be together as a body of Christ. Father, uh, speak to our hearts. Change us. Uh, clean us up. Make us more like you. We focus now on the Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Our invocation, uh, I'm sorry, our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 13 through 17. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. 
He called you to this through our gospel, that he might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teaching we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. It's my joy to welcome you to worship today. Uh, if you are a guest with us, you'll notice that there's a little blue card like this in the pew rack in front of you. We ask you to fill that out and make your offering. Put that in the offering plate today, if you would. And uh, we like to greet each other in the Lord here at Berea, so we're pretty good about shaking hands with those around us and saying a word of welcome and hello and things like, God loves you and so do I. Let's take about two minutes and greet each other in the Lord. Welcome. Hey, Lindsay. Nice job. All right, let's find our way back to our seats. Thank you. As part of uh, tomorrow's Veterans Day and as part of our observance of Veterans Day here at our church today, we're going to stand and we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, the Christian flag, and to the Bible. And then we're going to recognize our veterans. Let's stand together. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now let's pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and in love. Let's pledge allegiance to the Bible. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. Please be seated. In 
In this gathering, I know there are many of you who have served our country. If you are a veteran of the United States military, would you please stand? Thank you. We thank you for your service. We also want to recognize there may be others here who, besides myself, who have uh, family members who are no longer with us who were veterans. Let's recognize them. Would you please stand? We thank you for your relative's service to our country. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. We have a guest speaker today. Um, today is this, actually this month is National Adoption Month, and today is Orphan Sunday. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mike Dennehy, and if you would come at this time. God bless you, brother, as you share. it work? Hi. So many more faces than the earlier service. You guys are holier. You get more sleep. You're happier. Um, yeah. At the, at the first service, I was telling John this morning, my wife called me over. She was on Facebook. She's like, look at this. And John was uh, at the trunk and treat. And you see his costume? I was like, oh, my. I don't know if you've seen this, but he's like, it's, it's actually a leprechaun or something carrying him, and he's on its shoulders, but yet it's his legs. I don't get it, but it was beautiful. So, hey, um, just <laughs> we, we want to launch right into it. This is uh, National Adoption Month, which is why I'm up here, and I just wanted to let you know about it. My only qualifications for being in front of you is that we have the gigantic family. We have 13 children, my wife Sharon and I all together. We had three biological children first and then entered the world of adoption, and we've adopted 10 children from around the world. So we call them our homemade cookies and our store-bought cookies. Uh, if, if, you, if you know of any other good terms, that's the best I could do. My other favorite thing is being on an airplane. I travel a lot for work, and you know how you get in a little chit-chat with a person in the seat next to you, and it inevitably becomes, so do you have any kids? And I'll be like, yes, I do. Um, you got the next three hours to hear about my family. But I'm, I'm just real quickly, I, what I wanted to do was just remind everybody to think about adoption maybe in a way that you haven't thought about it before. There's a, there's a great quote that essentially says that the person who has rescued an orphan from misery has a keen sense for how much God loves us because you are adopted. So I wasn't going to play the trick on you, but I've been at adoption conferences where they ask who's been adopted, and you could get a few hands. Then they read from Romans. <laughs> it says if you're a believer, you're adopted into the family of Christ, and then they ask a second time, and everyone's like, oh, geez, you got me, right? But you just if you think of yourself as adopted, it gives you a different perspective on everyday life. Because Jesus came, think about it, he came, he sought after you, he bought you with his blood, and he's taken you home to be in his family forever. Pretty cool, huh? So um, if we did a show of hands, hopefully everyone would lift their hand and say, yes, I'm adopted. So I want to hit you with the, what I view as the greatest cartoon ever created in all of Christendom. This car cartoon is rich in theology. Look at this. So... <laughs> This, I love this thing. I don't know why. But I, what I'm, this is my excuse to tell you I got into adoption reluctantly. My wife was like, let's just adopt one child who needs a home desperately. And I was kind of like, oh, we got these three cute kids. And I was picturing like the white picket fence, 2.5 children, uh, one puppy. And instead it's, you know, it is what it is now, right? I, I, I call them by numbers sometimes when I, I'm tired. I'm like, number 12, stop pulling number 10's hair. You know, those kind of things. It's like, I'm exhausted half the time. But this, this was my plan on top, and God comes along and says, oh, no, this is how it's going to work. This also applies to the Christian life as well, right? Do you ever think, like, how am I going to get through this, around this, over this? God's got the plan. He just needs you to kind of let go of yours, right, and follow it along. So 
Um, this, is, this is only up here as a metaphor. This is our actual mantle at Christmas time. You can imagine. This is just the logistics of having a family this big are quite exciting. Uh, my wife's got calendar items entered for everything, and we have 101 of everything, dental appointments. Costco is our grocery store. Um, we buy like the 100 packs of everything, and then we drive in, drop it off, pull it through the circle, and head back to Costco. And they just consume it. It's like the locusts from the Bible. All, I find wrappers and empty things everywhere, you know, just drive in a circle. So this, my wife gets props uh, for keeping this whole crazy Barnum and Bailey circus together, but ultimately we both know it's a God thing. This is uh, just an illustration. I just, I could tell you God loves you and miracle stories uh, all day long, if I, if I could, if I had time, and I'm not going to take the time. But I just wanted to tell you one, just to kind of hopefully lift you up a little bit. This is a picture of my wife in Romania, in an orphanage with our first adopted son, George. George was neglected. He was born with no arms. So the nurses did, couldn't take the time to feed him. Each nurse was taking care of 150 babies. They'd skip him. And when we met him, he was a year and a half old, and he weighed nine pounds. And he couldn't hold his own head up. He had drool coming out the side of his mouth. And he looked, you could see the bones through his skin. It's not even, I didn't show you some of the worst pictures, but this is him wrapped up. It was, it was just sad to see, but that little kid, man, he opened like half of one eye and looked at us and kind of grinned a little bit. And I said, there's something going there. There's something in there. Well, he gets back. He gets healthy. He becomes the only person in the world to learn to play classical music. He learned cello with his feet. Then when he was at PH, he learned to play guitar. And now he travels around the world um, sharing the gospel. He's probably shared the gospel with 100,000 people. I mean, just he's a minister of God, and that's his full-time profession. So think about just like taking a, God takes broken things, and he makes them better. That's really what adoption is and, and why we should care about it. Um, this, this is one more quick story. I got to go and I got to get going fast. But we had a chance to go to Thailand to get our wonderful daughter, Hope, who's here. Hope's over there um, <laughs> sit, sitting in the wheelchair. Hey, Hope. Um, she's hiding. She's like, oh, God, Dad. No. But uh, when we were there to get her, they warned us that the uh, royal family of Thailand, we might have to meet with them. So we, my wife said, let's bring a Bible for the princess of Thailand. She's a Buddhist. We were really concerned because they have high uh, defamation laws there. You can get thrown in jail if you say anything wrong about a king, a queen, a princess. Long story short is we had a gift exchange. We gave her this very Bible that's in this picture. Her name um, had been engraved in it. My wife took it to a Christian bookstore, did the whole perfect title for royalty. She gets the, the thing, and then she's, I'm waiting. Like, we're going to go to jail. I know we're going to go to jail. And I said, well, the food will be good, right? Pad thai in jail. Um, <laughs> So, so we get a, the word back. She said she'll read it. That was the message we got back. She said she'll read it. We get back to the U.S. A year later, a lady in Thailand reaches out to us and says, every year we get a calendar. We have to put the calendar in the house. It's mandatory. It has wise sayings from the royal family. This year it had scripture from the Bible. So every household in Thailand got scripture put up on the wall, mandatory from the royal family, because maybe like one small act of obedience, God can see things that we can't. He sees ripple effects that we can't. So you might be thinking, what can I do, right? It's the old, like, throw one, one uh, thing back, one starfish back in the ocean. What good does it do? Well, sometimes God's got things cooking that you can't even imagine. So um, I'm going to conclude. I just want to show you this picture. This is us. Walking down the street in Ashland last Thanksgiving, it kind of looks like West Side Story, maybe. Uh, I don't know what this is. This is like there's some grandkids in here and a couple spouses, but uh, we have kids in our family now from Ethiopia, China, India, Romania, the U.S., and Thailand. So six countries mixed together, all shapes, all sizes, all colors. Hopefully, uh, this is what heaven is like. Um, we're going to be there, and God's going to look down and see us all gathered up, right? His children all gathered together in glory. So I want to encourage you. If you're uh, feeling a little bit motivated, maybe you want to do something, you can pray for people who are adopting. You can give them a good word, a word of encouragement. You can do some foster care if you feel energetic. Um, my wife is out at a table in the, you call it the lobby here? Narthex, whatever, <laughs> Narthex? My wife's out there, behind the wall, at a table. 
And they've got some literature and some things that could uh, maybe be useful to you if you feel the spirit giving you a nudge. So that's it. Thank you. A is number 476, Be Strong in the Lord. Let's stand together and sing all three stanzas, please. 476, or the words are on the screen. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage, your mighty defender is always the same. Count up and until then you're finding victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and rejoice for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has provided and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong. For the victory is always his. He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord. And be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, blessed be your name. We are grateful for all of the love, mercy, and grace you show us. For you are the Alpha and Omega. You are the one who sees our hearts. You provide strength when we are weak. You give us words when we have none. And you provide blessings even though we don't deserve it. Please forgive us of our sins, renew our faith, and allow our hearts to desire you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
We serve an awesome God, amen. amen. You know, I hope that's a truth, a uh, reality you've been able to experience this week, knowing that God has a great plan and a great purpose for you, and it's not by accident that we're in here this morning. Uh, it was funny, a little bit ago, I was coming in the side door right there, and Taylor had her stand up with her music on it, and I was looking at Lindsay uh, and Karen, and I was like, how, how much would this bother you if I, like, move your music out of the way and just kind of, like, get it out of the way? And they're like, oh, that wouldn't bother us at all. It's not ours. That's Taylor's. And I was like, man, how hilarious would it be if I just moved her music? Would she panic? And, of course, I didn't do it. But I was like, I got to stop playing jokes like that because just a few minutes ago I couldn't find my notes and I'm getting ready to come preach. And I was like, <laughs> I, was like I can't play around with people like that. It <laughs> be interesting to see what happened then. No, it, it is exciting uh, to be in God's house here this morning and, and talk. Uh, you know, life is tough. Uh, and I think we all can agree to that. I think we can look at it. And sometimes we get tired. Sometimes I think we get discouraged and a little bit overwhelmed. I was reading a story uh, the other day, uh, have you ever heard the expression, it's, it's enough to make a preacher cuss? Has anybody ever heard that expression? I, uh, a pastor stopped at a yard sale to buy a used lawnmower, and there was a kid who was doing his best to make the sale. And the preacher pulled the rope several times to crank the mower, but it wouldn't start. And the boy's looking at him. He says, look, you got to kick it, and you got to cuss at it a couple times before it'll start. And the preacher says, son, I can't do that. He said, I haven't said a cuss word in years. And the boy looked at the preacher. He said, just keep pulling that string. It'll come back to you. <laughs> We, you know, we, we joke, but sometimes it feels like that. Life feels like that a little bit sometimes. You get exhausted, and the chaos around us can be, uh, can be a little bit overwhelming. And we're not really sure how to approach it. As we step into this series under construction, we're talking about the idea, recognizing the reality that everybody is a construction site. We are all under construction, and we don't complain about the messiness of construction sites. We look at them, and we expect it. I even had this conversation yesterday with a guy. We expect to see a mess when you're at a construction site because you know something amazing is being built there. And we, when we start looking at each other that way, we begin to have a little bit more grace. We begin to have a little bit more compassion upon others, but also upon ourselves because we know that God isn't done with us yet. Today, we're looking at this idea of addressing instability in the world that we live in today, trying to find some kind of stability, something to grab a hold of. Uh, down at the uh, canal walk yesterday, I just happened to be down there, the boys and I were down there, and they're doing some construction, obviously. And so it's amazing when you start a series what you begin to pay attention to, and so I'm constantly looking at construction sites. And I was down there, and they're doing some work. They're, they're, they're working right next to the canal. So in order to fulfill and take care of all the things they need to take care of, they actually had to build a platform in the water to get in there and start doing the work. And I'm watching this the other day, the yesterday, you got like three guys on this platform in the water working, trying to put rebar up, trying to put some boards up so that they can pour some concrete. And I kind of chuckled a couple times because I'm like, that looks amazing. And you're just waiting for somebody to end up in the water because there's no balance there. You've got a platform that's maybe eight by eight feet with three guys on it trying to do some work and it's just a constant wave back and forth. Even though the water around is calm, they're constantly going back and forth. And you're waiting for somebody to just end up in the water. I'm looking around watching because it looked on occasion like one of them was heading in there and I'm thinking, who in the world is going to get him? Because I'm not doing it. It is cold, cold, cold. And on top of that, you know how it is. If you're, if you're covered in clothes, that stuff gets wet. You are weighed down tremendously. So I'm just watching. But it was amazing because I started thinking about that in the context of our own lives. Some of us right now feel like we're on that platform just waiting to fall off. We're trying to find some stability, trying to find something to grab a hold of, some truth that will give us solid ground that we can hold on to. And today we're going to do that. Paul is addressing something here in 2 Thessalonians that I think is absolutely essential for us to grab a hold of. Now, I don't know about you guys. I like watching some of the, the Peanuts cartoon strips. Has anybody ever watched those? Anybody ever read those? Some of y'all won't own up to it, but you know you all read it. We'll go through. And one of my favorites is an episode where Lucy and Linus are looking out the window at the, at the rain, and it's just pouring down. And Lucy says, boy, look at that rain. I wonder if it'll flood the whole world. And Linus replied, it'll never do that. The ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is a rainbow. Lucy smiles and says to him, you've taken a great load off my mind. And I love this because there's so much truth here. Linus says this, sound theology has a way of doing that. The more you dive into God's word and, and seek the truth of who he is here, the more stability you're going to find. Coming back to construction sites, you think about the size of those buildings. Some of them are massive, but a lot of times when you look at how tall a building is, do you ever 
imagine how deep they had to go to create a foundation that was there. I'm watching some of these buildings go up, and I'm not in construction, so I can't even begin to imagine it. But I watch the holes that are being dug for buildings that are seven and eight stories high, and they're massive. And why do they do that? They need something strong to hold the structure up for when storms and anything else happens. The same reality exists in our world. We've got to get beyond surface Christianity and move into the depth of God's word so that when hardship happens, and it's going to happen, you don't get pushed to the side and knocked out of the way. The roots are so deep. The, de the roots are so deep that, yeah, you might get pushed a little bit, but you don't get knocked over. Today we're diving into this because there's four truths that I want us to pay attention to when it comes to to Paul here in this passage and in our own lives. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the church. Can you keep going? Do we have it there? Yep. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or mouth, of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Pray with me. Father, as we dive into your word here, we need you. We need your truth, we need your goodness, we need your wisdom. Help us, Father, to trust in you during this time. Help us to set aside things that would distract us and just simply rest in you. Bless this time and may all that we do bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul is talking to the believers here about two specific things. He wants them to stand firm and hold on to the word of God. Now remember the context that's happening. And remember what he's experiencing. He's writing this church, writing this letter to a church that is experiencing tremendous amount of persecution. They also believe that uh, some of them that Jesus has returned. Some of them are to the point where they're not even working anymore. There's all kinds of confusion. There's a little bit of chaos. And Paul's saying, look, we've got to get back to the reality of what Scripture is saying and, and recognize the truth that is there so that the confusion that we're dealing with right now begins to make sense. We look at this right here, and for those of you who haven't been here for a couple of weeks, somebody help me out. What does this say? And then since we had about 100 of y'all say that at one time, I'll tell you what it is. Please be patient with me. Please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me Yet It looks confusing, it looks overwhelming, and you're like, what a mess. It had to have been a mistake, and yet when you begin to explain it, it makes more sense. Please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. And that's where we find ourselves. Paul's saying, look, you're dealing with heresies, you're dealing with persecution. Now I want you to grab a hold of some truth and never let that go. Hold on to it, and no matter what anybody else is saying around you, grab hold to the truth. Four truths I want us to pay attention to right here. Number one is this. God loves me unconditionally. If there is one overarching truth of the Bible, it's this. It's that God exists. The second thing close on the heels right there is the truth and the reality that this God who created everything by simply speaking things into existence has chosen to love you. Have you ever Googled a phrase, got on the internet and just Googled a phrase to see how many there were? I Googled this up this morning just to make sure I was right. The love of God, the phrase the love of God. If you Google that, you will find that there are 1.8 billion links talking about the love of God. People are trying to understand the love of God. They want to explain the love of God. And I'm here to tell you right now, you don't have to look on Google to find the love of God. And the explanation for it is right here. Dive into the depth of God's word. See who Jesus is and what he has done. And recognize all that's going on around you. Now much of the love that we experience in our world today is very conditional. What do I mean by that? It's based upon how we act and react. People will love us if we do this for them, if we respond to them this way, if we are there, whatever. There's some kind of condition that fits into it. That's where love comes from, and yet that is not the way that God loves us. We try to define love. God says, pay attention to my word. I'm going to show you what love looks like. And so you ask the question, why does God love us? God loves us because God is love. He looks at each one of us. He knows the depth of our sin. He knows the hidden sins that we don't want to tell anybody about. 
even those who are closest to us. He knows our past. He knows our future. He knows everything that we're encountering right now, all of that, and yet he still loves us completely, holds nothing back from us, loves us completely and totally. He doesn't love us because of who we are. He loves us because of who he is. And there's hope in that because it doesn't matter what I do. I'm, I'm, and, and I've said this before, but you can't do anything that will make God love you any more or any less than he already does right now. He loves you perfectly, and it has nothing to do with you, and it has nothing to do with me. And I'm so thankful for that. It has everything to do with who he is and how he desires to have a relationship with us. We look at this passage, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. He's like, I want to I emphasize this point. You guys are loved by the Lord. Right now, you may not feel like it. Guess what? It's not based on your feelings or your emotions. There is a truth to this that you have to grab a hold of. God loves you. God desires a relationship with you. God wants to be close with you and wants you to be close with him. He's not going to force it upon you, but he loves you. No matter where you are in life, God absolutely loves you. And yet, sometimes we walk away. Fear overwhelms us. Jeremiah 31, 3 says this, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. Pay attention to the other religions of the world or the other ideologies of the world, and it's always conditional. Do this, and maybe that deity will love you. We start looking. You, you can compare other religions. Start looking at, at Islam, for an example. You start paying attention to the Quran, and I have conversations. I have buddies of mine who are Muslim, and we have some interesting conversations because they want to tell me that Allah is the same as, as our God, and I'm like, we are not even in the same ballpark. We can talk about it all you want, but Allah means God in, in, in Arabic. That's the, the similarity. Other than that, the gods are not the same, not even close. I said, look at what you've got with the Quran. You have the five pillars that you have to follow. And hopefully if you follow them to a T and get everything correct, when you die, maybe, maybe, maybe he'll let you into heaven. I know that right now if I surrender my life to Jesus and follow him completely, I don't have to doubt or have any fear of what might come because I have an assurance of what Jesus has told me that there is an eternity waiting for me in heaven. I don't need to doubt that. I don't need to be afraid of that. I don't have to wonder without speculation, oh my gosh, am I doing enough to please God? I know that God's working in me. Am I going to mess up? Yeah, absolutely. But there's the joy of the grace of Jesus, and you have to grab a hold of that and never let it go. Because when you grab a hold of it, guess what? You're gonna, it's going to impact your relationship with God, but then it's going to impact your relationship with the people around you. Because when you start recognizing the grace that God has given to you, you begin to give that grace to other people. And that's one of the difficulties and one of the hardships that the church has had. Oh, oh, man. It's been one of those things that has plagued the church. It's that we love to tell people to love Jesus, but they got to love Jesus this way. they got to do it this way. you got to act this way. you got to dress this way. you got to talk this way. Here's my thing. God has created each one of us unique in here. We can, we can agree and we need to agree on one thing. Jesus is the only way. What you look like, what you wear, all these, that doesn't matter to me. What you've done in your past, that doesn't matter to him. Look at who Jesus interacted with. Look at what he is doing now. He's working in the hearts and lives of people everywhere if there's a willingness to surrender to him. So when we recognize that grace and hold on to it, we will begin to extend it to others as well. And the church explodes. The church booms because there's peace and hope, and it has nothing to do with you or me. It has everything to do with him. Brothers and sisters, you are loved by the Lord. I think about that Bible, that story in Luke 15 where you have the hundred sheep and the shepherd loses one of them, right? And we start talking about that and pay attention to that. And you're like, you know, sometimes you're like, that is so crazy to try to wrap your mind around it. And it even doesn't make sense. Why would you sacrifice? Why would you walk away from the 99 to go find the one? And, and I saw a t-shirt the other day said, you know, walking away from 91, 99 to find one doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you're that one. And that's where you got to recognize you're that one. And you got to be willing to surrender. I love this story. I was talking with a guy. He was sharing with me about what shepherds will do, those who have sheep. And he said, he said this, is, this is kind of an interesting story. And I feel like it fits well with who we are as individuals. He said there was a buddy of his who's a shepherd. He said one day he lost one of his sheep. And so the story obviously comes back up. Well, did you go find it? He's like, yeah, I went and looked at it. And I found it. I found it over there. It was hanging on a cliff. And he said all of us were over there. We were getting ready to try to pull this, this, this sheep up. And get it at, and try to rescue it. And he said, no, no, leave it there. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, that sheep wandered off. He said, you try to rescue that sheep right now, he's going to fall off that cliff and die. He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to leave that sheep there. 
for a day or two, maybe even three days. So by the time the three days are up, guess what? He wants to be rescued. He wants to come home. He's tired of hanging out on a cliff, not having anything to eat for a while, not being able to move or lay down and rest. He's ready to come home. And I feel like sometimes that's us when it comes to our Christian world. We're like, Jesus, you're right there. That's cool, but I'm going to go do my thing over here. And you know what? He's like, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not going to chase you and run, and run after you and move you away and try to run you off. He's like, I'm here for you. I'm going to be around you. I'm present for you. I love you. There's never a moment at which you are not welcome back into my arms. But you got to be willing. Three days later, he said, three days later, they went back. And there was that, that, that sheep was like hugging on him, loving on him, because he was so glad to be off of that cliff right there. How many of us are desperate for God? How many of us are desiring him? Remember that you are loved by him. The second truth I want us to look at here is this. God chose me before I believed. The Bible says this in, in this passage when we start looking. He says, from the beginning... The first fruits, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Now, there's something right here I don't want us to miss out on. I want us to pay attention to. You know, I remember as a, as a young child, you know, you're going out and you're playing kickball and playing dodgeball. Anybody remember that? You, those fun days? Some, some people don't have fond memories of those days. And this is why. You go out on the playground and you're picking teams. And you have two captains. And then they start picking. And then they start picking. And it's amazing because I stopped doing it. When I was a teacher, I, stopped, I basically just split teams up. I was like, this side of the class go here, this side of the class go here. Because each time when you're picking individuals, each time that person wasn't picked, you could see the head of the child just drop to the ground. By the end of it, they're like, why am I even here? They felt no worth because they weren't chosen because they just felt like they got pushed to a side and didn't feel like there was any value. What he's saying right here is you've got to understand God chose you. He saw the billions of people in the world and he chose you, number one. He chose you. He's not settling for you. He desires to know you and wants you to know him because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He says you surrender. You were chosen. Ephesians 1. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to what? To be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself according to his favor and his will. If you don't walk out of this feeling like, like the most valued person in the entire world, you are not paying attention because the God of the universe chose you above everything else. He chose you. Does that not blow your mind? And he desires to know you more and more and more. That's where he is today. That hasn't changed. Anything you've done hasn't changed an ounce of that love and desire to know you. You know, the word, when we start looking at this, there, there are three factors involved with a person being saved. You have the word of God, you have the work of God, uh, the spirit, and you have the will of the person. There's an example of that we find with Mary, mother of Jesus, when Mary is told that she will bear Jesus. I, I, I love looking at that story because anybody know the name of the angel who showed up to tell Mary? This is where it's fun, Bible trivia. Gabriel, very good. I saw you mouth it over there. Only two angels are named in the Bible. You have Michael, you have Gabriel, all right, when you're talking about God's people right there. So you have, my, uh, you have Gabriel, who is, who is kind of like their messenger. He shows up. He's, he's only talked about four different times in Scripture. Gabriel shows up to talk to Mary. He delivers a word from the Lord and says, from, from the Father, he says, this is what's going to be presented to you. This is what's going to happen, right? And Mary's response isn't like, hey, great idea. This is possible. She's like, that is impossible, this is not something, this is inconceivable. You, you can't do this. this. This can't happen. Why can't this happen? Because she wasn't married. She hadn't known a man before. So he's, a word is being delivered, and then all of a sudden, what does Gabriel say? He said, the Holy Spirit is going to take care of that. You have a transformation. You have a change that's coming, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have the word being delivered. You have a transformation, the power of the Holy Spirit. But I love when you look at this story and pay attention to it real closely because it wasn't as if all of a sudden God forced his will upon Mary. Do you know what happens? Mary says, Mary has to respond, and she says, let it be to me as you have said. Let it be done to me as you have said. God can present truth to you all day long. You have an option here and a choice. I tell you this at the, finish, at the end of each sermon, and we're not finished up right now, just so we know. But you are as close to Jesus today. Some of y'all are about to get excited like, man, he finished up early. You are as close to Jesus today as you want to be. That is entirely your choice. He hasn't gone anywhere. 
He is still the God of the universe. He has not stepped off of his throne. He still desires a relationship with you. He still loves you. He still chooses you. Now you have to choose him. And when you do, it will change everything. When you surrender to him in your life, there's nothing that God can't do in and through you. The third truth I want us to grab a hold of here is this. God gives me hope for the future. The Bible says this. Who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Somebody help me out here. How would you define fear? We know how fear makes us feel, but how would you define fear? It's tough, isn't it? I had a good definition. It was actually shared yesterday. I'll give it to you while you guys are pondering your definition. Fear is looking back into the past at all the negative things that have happened and making a prediction about what might happen into the future based upon your events in the past. Wrap your head around that one for a second. It's literally t- looking, you're in the present, you're looking in the back thinking, man, look at all those bad things. Not the good things, the bad things that happened, all those things that were negative upon our life and, and were really hard upon us that we struggled through, and then all of a sudden making predictions about the future based upon all those things that happened in the past. We negate God in the middle of the process. That's where fear comes in. And fear can paralyze us. Fear will cause us to look at those events, guess about what might happen in the future, and then all of a sudden we don't want to move at all because something bad might happen. And that's not what God has called us to. God has called us to recognize. Now, you get into Scripture, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fearing the Lord, not fearing the circumstances and the situations that happened there. It's the object of the fear. God, we, we fear God, we trust God, we, we rely upon God and recognize the majesty and the might with which God operates and the fact we need him, but we don't let circumstances around us terrify us. We can't. They do. A lot. If we're honest. But he says, look, I want you to understand, I'm here to give you a hope. I love that phrase right there in that passage. Who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. I love the idea of that. You you hear about churches called Good Hope Baptist Church, Good Hope Community Church, Good Hope Hope Church. There's a church when I lived in Texas about 20 years ago. There was the church we passed on the highway. It was called Little Hope Baptist Church. And I was like, I was like, we got a problem here. I'm not rolling up into Little Hope Baptist Church. You might as well write down No Hope Baptist Church in there. And I had, to find out, I had to find out what the deal was with Little Hope Baptist Church. It ended up getting the back, the, the back story to the whole thing. There was a little girl back in the early part of the 1900s named Hope Moore who lived in the community, had been ill. The community rallied around her, and unfortunately she passed away. But her parents donated the land for a church right there in her honor, in her name. And so they named it Little Hope Baptist Church. I'm like, y'all need to add something to that sign that says a whole lot of hope can be found at Little Hope Baptist Church. Make it a little bit clearer. But... We desire, we long for hope. We're looking for hope, something to give us peace, something to give us comfort, something for us to to grab a hold of each and every day. And that's what he gives us right there. Hebrews chapter 6 says this, We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives, safe and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. We have a hope in Jesus that exists nowhere else in the world. No matter what you're looking at, no matter what you might depend upon, Jesus is the only hope that lasts eternal. This passage right here talks, uses the word called an anchor, an anchor for our lives. I started thinking about that in the context of biblical times and what an anchor looks like. You know, when I think of anchor today, I think of those massive things that come off the ships and drop to the ground, into the water to keep these ginormous ships from going anywhere. But think about this in biblical times. You didn't have those massive ships. Yeah, you had some large ones, but what they would do is they would drill a hole through stone, which again is an amazing process. I couldn't even wrap my head around how in the world did you do that. But they drill a hole through stone and then put a rope in it. Now, they didn't have the ability to to control the direction of the ship as well as we can today. So what they would do once they were pulling into a harbor, in order to make sure that they were safely getting into the harbor, is they would take one of the small boats that was on the larger ship, they would put somebody in it, and they would row into the harbor. They would take the anchor with them, attached to the rope, attached to the big ship. Everybody following me so far? 
And then they would take that into the harbor to a safe spot, and then they would drop the anchor in the water. And then, based on a pulley system, they would basically, the anchor would pull the ship into the harbor. When we start paying attention to the fact that God is our anchor, Christ is our anchor, we don't need to be terrified about anything. If we trust him and don't fight him on everything, he's pulling us into the presence of Almighty God every single day. I've told you before, we long to know the will of God, right? You want to know what God wants for your life. You want to know what God desires right now. But you can't get into the will of God and understand it until you get into the presence of God. And the only way to get into the presence of God is through prayer and surrender. Are you willing to do that today? Trust in him. Jesus is our anchor and our hope who draws us into the very presence of God. Number four, God gives me strength to stand firm. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father encourage your hearts and strengthen you. When you look at verse 15 in that passage right there, he talks about standing firm, standing firm, standing firm. We see it again in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I love that passage right there. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Some good music goes along with that too. But be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You know what, he, what Paul continues on with right there? He goes on and talks about the, the armor of God, to put on the armor of God. And you need to put on the armor of God every day. Why? Because you are in a battle. You are in a fight. And you can't ignore it. You can't act like it doesn't exist. It's there. It's very real. Put on the armor and get in the fight. But he's saying right there, and, and it's so important for us to pay attention to, he says right there, I want you to be strong, not in your own ability or in the armor or in what you think is right. I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the power, not of your hand and of your weapon, but in the power of his might. You have almighty God living on the inside of you. Does that not blow anybody else's mind? You literally have the creator of the universe working in and through you, and we walk around terrified about life sometimes. And I get it. We have moments where we are exhausted, where we are stressed out, where we are overwhelmed and confused. And, and those parts of life are going to happen. We don't need to hang out there forever, though. Remember who God is. That's why we have these times where we can come together. That's why we come together as a church, because you can be encouraged. You can be lifted up. When I'm tired, you can encourage me. When you're tired, I can encourage you. We can build each other up as a family, as brothers and sisters in the Lord. What do you think Paul is doing right there? He says, I want you to remember this, brothers and sisters. God loves you. God chose you. Be strong in him. Be strong in him. Be strong in him. One of my favorite, one of my favorite books in the Bible is Joshua. You get into Joshua chapter 1, and, and, and in case you didn't know, Joshua, who did Joshua follow in leadership? Moses, very good. He, Chris was around during that time. He said it was a heck of an election to get Josh in there. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Moses, he followed Moses, so Joshua has to lead. Could you imagine having to follow after Moses? Oh, my gosh. A little bit intense right there. Quite a, the, the shoes would have been massive to try to fill. And yet God tells him, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, look through there. He says, look, I want you to be strong and courageous. I want you to be strong and courageous. I, he doesn't say it once. He says it several times. I want you to be strong and courageous. And then I want you to know why you're going to be strong and courageous. Because I'm going to go with you wherever you go. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. If that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what will. In, in all honesty, nothing will. If the God of the universe telling you to be strong and courageous because I'm going to go with you doesn't give you hope, there's nothing in this universe that can do it. Remember the truth of who he is and grab a hold of it right now. He gives me the strength to stand firm. There was a story of a guy, and, and it was wild. I was reading it. It happened in 1987. Uh, and it was, it was, there was a guy, or two pilots, and the guy's name was Henry Dempsey. They were basically taking a commuter airplane from, from Maine to Boston. They had no passengers on board. They get up into the air. They're climbing for takeoff, and, and Henry hears a banging noise from the back of the aircraft. So what he does is he goes, gives the control to the co-pilot, goes back to sea, recognizes that one of the doors wasn't completely shut, so he reaches down to, to shut it. And at that moment, they hit turbulence. And what happens is the doors fly open. The co-pilot looks back, and it looks like Henry is gone. He's crying out. He, he, he gets on there and starts talking to him says, look, we need to get somebody out to find his body. There's no way he survived. There's no way he survived. He can't see that underneath the plane, Henry's holding on to the door. 
He has no idea that Henry is still there. He finds the, the closest air, uh, airport that he can get to, and he goes in. Henry's head was less than a foot away from the ground when he landed that day. But he was holding on to the door. When the paramedics got to him, they couldn't get him to let go. His hands had gripped. They were like, it would take hands of steel to grab a hold of that door and not let go when you're, when you're flying 200 miles an hour and hitting turbulence like that and landing on an airfield. He would not let go. He ended up being fine. But I started thinking about that in relation to, uh, to uh, our spiritual lives. Do we grab a hold of God's word? Do we grab a hold of the Lord like that and not ever let go? Do we grip him with hands of steel and no matter what's going on around us, hold on to the truths of his word? Because I'm telling you right now, the world we live in today, the culture we live in today is trying to redefine truth, trying to redefine morality and what it means to experience hope and trying to redefine salvation. And the answers for all of that are right here. Whether the culture and world want to agree with it doesn't matter. The truth is here. And we've got to hold on to that. You can't ever let that go. You can't ever back down from it because your soul, eternity, depends upon it. But this is where we finish out. Each and every day you have a choice. Henry very well, very easily, and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, door fly open on a plane, odds are pretty good I don't grab the door. Game over. And yet he held on. You have a choice today. We can surrender to him and to his will and trust the plan that he has for our lives. Or we can continue to meander through life wondering why we can't understand what God is doing and never once diving into his word. I'm telling you right now, getting into God's word is not going to make life easy. That's a lie straight from the devil. It's actually going to make life a little bit more difficult because the devil is going to attack you. But there's hope here. There's hope in recognizing who he is. You read the stories. You hear about them all the time. Trust in what he's doing. Surrender to him and let him work in your life because it is the only thing that will change your life. You have a choice. You are as close to Jesus today as you want to be. How close do you want to be? That's entirely up to you. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and goodness and for the love that you've given to us. We thank you for the salvation that we have in you and you alone. And, Father, the hope that it exists. Father, I'm just in awe, honestly, Lord, of the fact that you chose me, that you chose each of us. And each day, that doesn't change. You don't look back in regret thinking, man, I wish I hadn't chosen them. You love us deeply. You want nothing more than to draw us closer to you, God. Help us to surrender our own wills, to surrender our own pride, to surrender our own strength to you because you change lives. Father, guide us and direct us today. May all that we do bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Invitation hymn is 296. Jesus is Lord of all. Is he your Lord? Let's stand together. You come. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master, in joy and in strife. is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day. Jesus is Lord of all. Blessed all glorious King, worthy of reverence I pay, tribute and 
Amen. Amen. Uh, that's a truth and a reality that, that you know and understand. Uh, today, I'm going to get you guys to come stand over here. It's exciting. We have, we have a couple people coming in here today. Uh, Regina is coming, uh, has been coming for a while now, right? Basically, since you graduated from like CNU. And, and just God's been doing some amazing things in and through her. And so she wants to transfer her membership uh, here to Berea. So we're excited about that. So can somebody give me a motion that we accept her? Somebody second it? All in favor say amen. 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 So now you get to stay here. Don't go anywhere. She was like getting ready to dart down the aisle. I was like, you got to stay. You know how this works. And then John, John is coming too. Uh, John is excited again about what God is doing, uh, having, having just seen him moving in his life. And so he wants to come transferring his membership as well. So can somebody give us a motion? Somebody second it. All in favor say amen. 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 And he, I, I told him the other day when we were talking, I said, you got to give about a 10-minute speech. And it's always fun because you see the panic in people's eyes at that moment. See if they really love Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but now, be sure to come up here and tell these two right here how much you love them and are excited about what God is doing in their life because it's truly uh, just a blessing to see. Uh, let me close this in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and goodness, God. We thank you for Regina and John, Lord, and just how you're working in each of their lives and how you're continuing to work in this church, God. We just pray for your wisdom, pray for your guidance and direction, pray that in all things we would seek you out. Help us to take the truth of who you are and share it with those who we encounter today. May all that we do bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.